this Saturday. It's uh, the fifth year we're running this, so it's kind of um, it's become an annual event um, sponsored by the Sim Student Chapters. Anybody know what Sim is? Oh, it says there. Good. <laughs> Beyond that, the current president is actually uh, Cliff Muller, who's a MATLAB developer. So he's. Um, um, anyway, so we've had uh, presidents from around the region too. So um, it's it's an interesting uh, uh, conference because it's a lot of people from uh, Boulder, Denver, and other other schools from the region go to. And usually the keynote speaker is, uh, I think, in particular this year is actually very good. So. Um, so anyway, I think if you're interested in going, um, contact one of the people in the Science Student Chapter. I don't give names here, but if you email me, you know, I can give you those information. Um, I think there's some, some carpooling uh, done. Um, so it's kind of a, well, if you have nothing else to do on Saturday, you can um, consider doing this. And I heard after the conference, people usually hang around in Denver for in the bars in Denver. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see uh, how much of that homework I'm going to leave for Monday. Um, so I want to talk today about Picard iterations. A little bit of that, a little bit of existence uniqueness, and I want to focus on um, um, equilibrium and basically the tools for um, compute, for for analyzing these nonlinear systems because they are very uh, sort of sometimes can be very unruly. Um, <clears throat> so. Let me set the stage here. Just say, um, that that's the form of the differential systems or the nonlinear systems. That we're going to consider. So, um, basically this function capital F is going, going to represent all the right hand sides of, of your differential system. Okay. Um, and it's a nonlinear function. And I said last time what it means to be a smooth function, uh, or what do we mean by smooth? F, which you know would have sort of components, is um, C1 if. Uh, pretty much the partial derivatives of all functions with respect to all variables, all components with respect to all variables, are continuously differentiable. Okay. So it's very easy to come up with examples where this doesn't happen, where this is not the case, like powers, you know, one third power, for instance, we saw last time. Um, so we're going to try to stay in this um, with this assumption. Then there is this existence and uniqueness result uh, called theorem, which is true for. Um, The case when the right hand side is C1, it doesn't have to be continuously differentiable everywhere, but at least locally, okay? So uh, somewhere in near the initial condition. So if you consider the initial value problem, which says 
which gives the equation and it gives initial condition. Now, in the past we've given the initial condition only at um, zero, right? We said x at zero is x naught. But we, you know, because this is this is a, a autonomous system. That's pretty much equivalent of give, at fixing the initial time at some other time, uh, t naught, and just assigning that value. You know, you know basically in that phase space that's where it starts, or or that's where the system is at time t t naught is at location x naught. Okay. So then this with f uh, c one function. So continuous is differentiable. Okay. Then um, two things happen. Well, there exists basically a solution x as a function of t. Then there exists x as a function of t. Uh, but just t may not be defined for an entire for an entire axis. Remember, for nonlinear systems, you don't you don't necessarily have solutions that exist for all times, like the tangent. It was blowing up uh, very you know over a very short period of time, so you cannot go beyond a certain amount of time. Um, so the interval is we like to write it as uh, excuse me t naught. Minus a t naught plus a, so that's I should put open here. So this is um, centered at t naught, and t naught um, plus a t naught minus a just indicates like sort of the lifespan of that solution. So if you if your solution starts at t naught, then it exists. This statement says that it exists at least for some time past T0 and before T0. A solution of the initial value problem and it is unique. That is, uh, what does that mean? That is, If y would be a solution, would be another solution uh, defined on, let's say, t naught minus b, t naught plus b, then x of t is identical with y of t for t in this interval um, well the smaller of the two you know the smaller of the two intervals so t naught minus b t naught plus b let's say I don't know let, let's just say uh, b is greater than a and just but then it would be between on the smaller interval. Okay, so here, here's what I mean by uniqueness. Uniqueness means this is in one D, n equals one, so I can plot x versus t easily, right? So I have the initial condition here. I have x not here, and I have one solution. Well, the first statement is that there is a solution. Okay. Of the 
that fits that direction curve, direction field, right? And uh, the second statement says that there is no other solution. Uh, you know, maybe maybe the only way is if it's over a larger interval, for instance. Okay. This is this is the only way two two solutions going to the same point can be different, right? Does it make sense? So you cannot have so you cannot have you know, so um, so things like this cannot happen. You cannot have a solution going through here and a solution going through here. This cannot happen if F is C1. Okay? So if I have a right hand side that's continuously differentiable, even though, right, I mean this this is possible, this is the in principle you could, you could say well both, the, both of these functions uh, curves have the same slope at that point, right? So they match the direction field at that point, but what's the extra requirement for both of these curves? Well, they have to match they have to match uh, in the whole interval, they have to match the direction, the direction field. Okay? So when you have a direction field, like you've seen that many pictures, and you pinpoint a a pinpoint uh, initial condition, then you can only find one curve that match that goes to that direction field, tangent to direction field, going through that point. Okay, it's a non-trivial fact. In fact, if it's if you've seen examples that if it's not uh, smooth, so it's not uh, continuously differentiable, if the right-hand side is not continuously differentiable, then um, This situation can can occur. You have multiple solutions that go through the same initial condition. Distant solution, right? Yeah. So the, your implication is that outside of A, X can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to follow. Well, it follows. Well, in fact, that's part of the. Uh, the theory here is that if there is one that is uh, lives longer, right, then it has to match the initial condition at the end of the first one, right? So then it's again unique, right? And so it, it turns out that you can actually create this uh, you know, uh, so starting with an initial condition and have a small, like a very short lifespan solution, right? Maybe that's not the maximum lifespan, right? Maybe maybe the solution lives a little bit longer, and then that solution lives a little bit longer, right? So in fact, there is a maximal interval of existence for a solution. So in the end, there's going to be something has got to happen. And for that the, for that interval to to be maximal, right? It's possible that this solution goes to infinity, has a vertical asymptote, right? That basically says I cannot extend it any any further, right? That's pretty much what it can happen in one dimensions. Um, because if there's no vertical asymptote, then you can actually go to infinity, then you can extend that interval, right? Let me give you an example. So, so again, this is the contrast with uh, can happen if f is not c1. And the example was x prime equals x to the one-third, right? 
that's a situation where you have one solution was zero and the other solution was zero and then it just departed, right? Both curves fit the direction field. That is, both, both curves verify this, but they're not the same, okay? One is not an extension of the other. Okay, so um, about this interval of, of, of lifespan, about this lifespan, it's a very important thing to, to um, uh, sort of understand. So let's, let's think about this particular one. Yeah. Like yes, please. Uh, Um, no, it's just a very simple prototype of when the situation, when the things go bad. Well, it's just, I'm not sure how much, you see, this may seem like an obvious fact, okay? But it's not an obvious fact. So uh, this is just kind of, Counterexample to this, when this when this doesn't really happen, okay, you cannot have things that that touch and then just part, okay. Why is this important? Because in two dimensions, and this this is in one dimensions, but um, in two dimensions, what happens is the following: is um, Let me try to write the equation for two dimensions to see that um, okay I just want to pick that van on that van der Poel so x1 prime equals x uh, 1 minus x1 cubed plus y uh, plus x2 and x2 prime equals minus x1. Okay? okay? There's no one third and nothing. So this is actually a nice, a good, good case scenario, right? That is, curves cannot, solutions cannot to, uh, solutions to initial conditions are unique. Okay? When we draw the picture um, of, the of various solutions, we get we get this this type of solu uh, periodic solution, right? We got a periodic solution, and the key is the following: if there is such a periodic solution, then what's inside? Can never escape outside. That's that's what that statement is saying. Why? Eventually, it'll get to the solution. It never it never gets it never touches this. Okay. Now you can you can look at the direction field and you see that it's going out towards it, right? But it cannot touch that, right? So it cannot go outside of this, right? Well, if you have a model where actually this there is a one third or something, then you can actually happen to have that, okay? So in two dimensions, in several, in multi dimensions, that can actually happen. You can have, in other words, the the type of reasoning that works for these won't work for those those situations, okay? And um, uh, I don't have to look too far to see and to give an example. So this is this is existence and uniqueness is okay. I mean, because what is F? The two components, right? This is is C one. Right? Because it's continuous, it's polynomials, derivatives, partial derivatives are also continuous. In fact, 
The second derivative is also continuous, so it's more than C1. Of course, this example is probably, uh, but it's that um, that thing from the um, um, central forces. So mass times acceleration is a gravitational force. So it's minus k over let's say an R2. So this is x1, x2. Uh, I'm sorry, this is x cubed x. Okay? We, I think I listed this as the first example. So x1 double prime is minus k x1 over x1 squared plus x2 squared over 3 halves and x2 double prime is minus k x2 over x1 squared plus x2 squared through 3 halves. This in two dimensions, right? So it's an object that's attracted by the origin, right? And this is the system, it's a system of two second order equations, so it can be converted to a system of four first order equations, right? Look at the right hand sides. Are they C1? They are C1 if you are outside of the origin, right? But when you are the origin, is not C1. So uh, that just signifies there is a singularity at that point, right? So these are rare and actually, well, this, these are the kind of difficult cases to, to study. The ones where, where you don't have the uniqueness, where you don't have that kind of uh, property. But, you know, in four dimensions it's already kind of tough to talk about bounding boxes. Like, even if you have a periodic solution, and you do, right? What's a periodic solution for this? Well, it's a Ellipses, right? In fact, I think all of them are ellipses. Um, but the fact that you have ellipses don't doesn't really tell you that solutions, you know, inside don't go outside because this is just two dimensions. We're in four dimensions, right? So we have a lot of freedom to go around curves. So in that scenario, there's. The, the analysis would be different. We would say not a not a not a curve bounds a region, but like in 3D, a surface bounds a region, right? So you'd, or in 4D, it would be a hypersurface. Um, but so I don't know if I answered. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is just a toy thing. I mean, it's just a toy thing to to kind of. Sh highlight how important this existence uniqueness uh, really is. Okay. Now, how do we prove such a thing? Okay, that's um, actually something I will kind of leave it for towards the end, uh, the precise proof, but the idea is the following. And this idea works in, in two dimensions, in one dimension, and dimensions. But um, So how do you prove this? Again, all I'm saying is not a trivial thing. It's not a trivial fact. Okay, but it's true. So whether you want to look at the proof or not, that's up to you. But for um, practical purposes, for instance, for approximating solutions, then uh, you can use this quite quite um, uh, efficient, this idea, I mean not the actual proof, but the idea of the proof. Um, so the idea of the proof involves so-called uh, Picard iterations. And Picard iterations start, it's almost like that uh, Newton's method. Um, There is actually a typo on the book um, on page 144. So let me let me make sure um, we get that. So let me do this for n equals one, and you'll see what that is very similar to uh, any n. So we're we're just looking at a very simple first order equation, right? Where f is c1, and we'd like to approximate. 
to find uh, a sequence of functions and let's call that uh, u1 of t, u2 of t, u3 of t, and so forth, uh, such that the limit of this sequence is the actual solution of the initial value problem. So I should say what the initial value problem is x of t naught is x naught. Which, remember, it's like we denoted by this as well. So it's the flow. It's what constitutes the solution of the differential equation that at t0 is x naught. Okay? So we'd like to, to uh, gradually get closer and closer to that solution. We don't know the solution exactly. That's, that's the thing. We don't know how to solve it exactly. We'd like to approximate it. And we do that by the following. So convert the differential equation to an integral equation. Now, if you've never seen this, that's um, you know that's something probably new, but it's simply integrating with respect to t. So, what is this? Integrating with respect to t gives you x of t, right? Integrate with respect to t between t naught and t. So then I need I need to change this to s. S ds is the integral from t naught to t f of x of s ds. Okay? So, integral of the derivative is x of t minus x of t naught has to equal integral from t to t naught to t of f of x of s ds. So, x of t is x of t naught plus the integral from t naught to t of f of this, right? So in other words, now if I give you a function, x, how are you going to check that x is a solution or not? Can you check it by, by verifying this equation? instead of taking the derivative of x? Right? How do you check it? x prime equals f of x? Well, I give you a function x, you differentiate x with respect to t, and you see that it's the same as f of x. Here is similar. If I give you an x, well, you would have to integrate f of x, add this constant, and, and get x, x of t, right? But they're equivalent ways. So that's basically the integral form of that differential equation. And now the idea is the following is start with uh, so this I should say is x naught here. So start with uh, an initial guess. U naught of t. Okay, and we'll see what kind of guesses we can um, choose. Then, what will be the next function that we're going to try to build uh, to consider? Well, it's like this: taking this iter iterate of this. So, we're going to take f of u naught, integrate it, add x naught, and call that u one. If, by chance, our guess was actually the solution, then u1 would have been, would be the same as u0, right? Would be the solution here. So if we, if we start with the actual the solution as initial guess, then when we construct this new function, then we stay, right? Always stay there. 
If we don't start with an, with, well, and we usually don't know the solution I had, right? So we just start with the initial guess. And you'll see sometimes we pick as a constant function or something. And then we uh, crank this iteration. So we, we construct this new function. And now what are we going to do with, what are we going to do with this function? We're going to apply the same iteration called this Picard iteration. So U2, we're going to be defined as you take f of u1, integrate, add x0, and call this u2. And you keep going. And then if you have an initial guess that's not a solution, then that's going to change, right? And the argument, I mean, the proof is to show that this sequence actually converges to that, gets closer and closer to that solution. Okay? So what remains? So so, uk plus one. That's probably okay to write. Um, this is the general. This is the iteration at k at time k at step k. So this is the kth iteration. Okay. So that's. Yeah. I'm curious what conclusion that one could make if the integral could not be computed. Uh, explicitly? Yeah. Most of the time it cannot be completely explicitly. So how would you ever take that? Well, um, there is, and that's that's where we cannot really do the whole proof because it requires real analysis argument, which says. Um, if if the if the thing under the integral converges to something, then the integral of that uh, integrand converges to the integral of that something. Okay, so we don't we don't have to do anything explicit here. In fact, the proof doesn't use any explicit, but it uses results from analysis that I don't know everybody has had analysis. Probably not, right? Um, if you had analysis, then you can actually uh, make this precise. Okay. So all I want to say now is, is and, and, and again, later in the semester, I can um, we can look at this uh, in a more precise fashion. But I want to show you how how you can actually use this. Um, so so it turns out that um, if T minus T naught is not too big. It's small. And that's where that A comes in, right? So for some small uh, deviation from this T naught, so T minus T naught less than some A, then this. Uh, UK as K goes to infinity converges to something as you've seen probably so let me put it like this K um, greater than 1 converges and then the limit is going to be what you call to be X of T right? so you define the, the function by being the limit of those of that sequence. Okay, everybody knows what's a convergent sequence. Okay, maybe not a convergent sequence of functions, but this is true for any t. Okay, so any fixed t. For any fixed t, this is a sequence of real numbers converges to some limit. That limit is going to be x, and of course, it's going to depend on t. And again, this requires some proof. And then, also the fact that I just said, you know, if you know this, then x, the limit, will satisfy actually the integral, e integral equation. <coughs> also, x satisfies, you know, you, you would just take the limit in that, e in that 
in that uh, equation. X of t, that's the limit of uk plus 1 of t, right? Equals x naught plus integral from t naught to t f of the limit. So it means this is a solution. So it goes to the solution, right? It tends to the solution. So this Picard iteration um, pinpoints or gets uh, in the limit the solution. But for a very small time interval, in fact, can you, can you guess, well, can you imagine choosing a different initial guess, maybe farther away from the actual solution? Then what's going to happen with the uh, with a sequence is going to converge, but for an even smaller time interval around T naught, right? So this is going to depend on what our initial guess will be. Let's look at it. I mean, the the the, the one example, and again, the typo is in this formula, right, on page uh, 144. There should be f under the integral, f of uk. Of course, if I have just the equation x prime, that's the growth, exponential growth, right? If I only have that, let me, let me change it to put a, a times x, okay? x prime equals a times x. And I want x of um, t naught to be x naught. Okay, we know what the solution will look like, right? What will it look like? Let's say a is positive. So hmm? It's going to be um, so the actual solution is going to be what? It's going to be x naught e to the a t minus t naught. Agree? Basically, a constant e to the a t, and you, if you figure out that constant to match the initial condition, you'll see that it has to be of this form, right? Because at t equals t naught, this is zero, so x at t naught is x naught. Okay. Anyway, so we know this. So what? How, how can you visualize the Picard iteration? Well, just to convince yourself. I mean, that's. That's important, you know, in this simple example to uh, visualize this Picard iteration, and then, you know, because in many other cases you won't be able to visualize any of this. Okay? So, what's the initial guess? Well, why not pick, as I said, the simplest possible, right? Um, if you want to pursue this Picard iteration a few steps, then you want to start very simple, right? So let's just take it to be constant. Now, you, you don't have to take it to be constant x naught, right? But the next iteration, you will end up with something that goes to this point. So it might be as, as well as picking up something that goes to this point. So this would be u naught, right? That's the u naught. Okay, let's do u1. u1 of t is x naught plus integral from t naught to t of what? Well, what's f? This is f, right? So it's going to be a times x naught, exactly, plus uh, ds. So this is x naught plus a x naught t minus t naught. Okay? And I don't know, it looks like it's going to be linear in t, so the very next one is going to be three, still going through this point, right? Uh, and I, 
I'm probably going to get it wrong, but it's going to be linear in T, right? So it's going to be U1. What's going to be the next one? So this is U1. Okay, what's going to be the next one? So that's the initial guess. Anyway, so you keep doing this. You can see the next one will be quadratic, right? A times, maybe we should write it down. Um, X naught plus A X naught S minus T naught. So when you integrate this, it's going to be what? X naught plus A T minus T naught X naught. Plus, what's the other term? Is A squared? x naught, and it's s minus t naught integrated, so that's going to be t minus t naught square over 2, right? So this is going to be quadratic. It's going to be a parabola going through that point, and of course it has a very specific uh, orientation. Yep. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I, I jumped U1, right? And this is U2. Thank you. U2. Okay. So now it's okay? All right. Thank you. Um, right? So what you see is you see this sequence. That, uh, well, it has actually a pattern. You can see that uk of t starts the same way, x naught plus a t minus t naught x naught plus a squared t minus t naught square over 2 x naught plus what's the k term is going to be a to the k t minus t naught k over k factorial x naught. So do you see what the limit of uk is? Well, it's x naught, and then it's 1 plus a t minus t naught plus, it's basically the, this power series that has, we know what the limit of this is, e to the a t minus t naught. Okay? So if we didn't know anything about the solution, this statement basically says, well, this limit is a solution. Okay. Okay. So, and this actually gives you the solution even when it's not possible to write down the solution. In this limiting process, right? Um, is this how that p plane or OD solve uh, approximates? No. Okay. There are other ways. Well, there are more efficient ways to approximate a solution, but. This Picard iteration is um, kind of should give you an idea of what it takes, like in two dimensions or in three dimensions or in n dimensions, to to make that statement. Give me the initial condition. I look at the differential equation, differential system, right hand sides. It's continuously differentiable. Well, then I know that there is only one solution. How do I know? Well, because of, of well, I know there is a solution. I haven't showed you how why it's unique. I know there is a solution, right, that matches that direction field. Uh, how do I know? Well, it's basically a limit of this Picard iterates. Okay? In fact, uh, one can do the same, exactly the same. In fact, I think that's one of your homework. Uh, to show that if I have an n by n linear system, the Picard itera iterations to show that for this, the Picard iterations, in this case, I don't know, they're, they're 
uh, vectors, right? Vector valid. And the limit of that is what? Okay, uh, I'll do the x of 0 at this point just so it's easier. x of 0 is x naught. That's initial value problem. The Picard iterates, uh, iterations actually converge to the same to the solution, which we know how it looks, right? And the proof is exactly the same because you start with initial condition, initial guess, which is constant, and then then you get all those ex, uh, basically the terms of the Taylor expansion of this exponential. So I think that's something you um, you can check for yourself. Um, there's another example in the book that it's more explicit. Um, see example on page uh, 145, for which the matrix A is um, has complex roots. So this is the rotation, purely pu purely complex, purely imaginary, right? Plus and minus i. And again, do the uh, iter look at the how you know the Picard iterations are being generated, and you will see that it actually in the limit you get exactly this the solution. Okay. Now, why would it be unique? And again, something um, we can say something, but not, not really um, give a complete proof. So, how to see how uh, to prove uniqueness? Um, Well, let me just list this here, which, again, um, has, has its own proof. Um, let's say I have x of t be a solution of this uh, nonlinear system with initial condition x naught and y of t be a solution of y prime equals f of y and y of t naught is y naught. So possibly different ones. Of course Uniqueness means if initial conditions is the same, then the solutions are the same. Okay. Well, the, the statement is the following: is that um, there exists a time interval. T naught minus delta, T naught plus delta, and a constant k such that you can measure the distance between these two solutions at, any, at, at time t be, between these two uh, between these time intervals. So the difference between the x of t and y of t is a constant k, that constant k. The distance between x naught and y naught e to the k t minus t naught for t in this interval. Okay. So what does this say? This actually says more than uniqueness. So this has a 
but let's let's first understand what it says. It says that if I start with two initial conditions that are, you know, some distance apart, okay? Then this solution does its thing, and this and, and this solution does its thing, right? It evolves. Let's say with time bigger than t naught. Well, this statement guarantees that for a short period of time, at least, the distance you know between the solutions at time t is no bigger than this. Okay. How does this imply uniqueness? Assuming, assuming we, we kind of we have a proof for this statement. How would this imply uniqueness? If the initial conditions are the same, right? Because this doesn't say anything about them being different, right? It says if you start with initial conditions that are the same, x naught and equal y naught, then this guy is zero. So then this guy is less than or equal than zero. But this is also positive, right? So how can a distance be negative? It has to be zero. So it means so this implies uniqueness in particular this theorem, again, that is given here without proof. And again, the proof is not difficult. It actually relies on that integral uh, statement. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, but I'd like to get, get through uh, to the nonlinear techniques uh, really fast, especially for the project. Uh, implies uniqueness. Because if x naught is y naught, this means that x of t minus y of t is less than zero, right? At least for that small interval. So it means x of t is y of t. So it, I, it matches that for that short interval. How do we know that it doesn't depart at a later time? They part. Well, so it means that if I start with a solution, for a very short time, it has to stay the same, right? How do I know it doesn't go like, at some time, it departs? Well, if this is at time t equals t0, at any later time, at like t later time t1, I can take that to be my initial condition, and then I'll be able to figure out that there is a solution and it's unique, right? And they still stay together, right? For a little bit more period, uh, for a little longer. And then at the new time, for a little longer, right? One thing that we will never know is how long is it going to take for the solution to exist, and that's the time span, okay? And that may be finite. It may actually be that this goes to infinity in finite time, right? But for as long as they exist, it's always unique. Okay? Right? There's no chance for them to depart. As long as that they are in a region where that uh, right-hand side, that direction field is smooth. It's, it's at least continuous, continuously differentiable. Right? So the solution x, y of t are, must be identical um, for as long 
as they exist. Meaning that, you know, there is a there is a maximum time of existence, time of existence is basically t less than um, t naught plus capital T, so capital T um, max, let's call it capital T max, right? So this exists for t less than t max, t naught plus t max. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I should say this. Let's, let's forget the t naught. Just t max is here. That's going to be the t max. The, the t max, and this could be infinite. Okay. In fact, there are very very simple examples again in n equals 1 where you have solutions that exist for finite time and, so, and for the same system solutions that exist for infinite amount of time what is, the, what is an example like that? remember that? what is, this, what is the phase portrait of this? well 0, 1 here is doing whatever it's doing its thing so it's positive, right? But then here is positive. Well, what's the time, what's the time uh, lifespan of the solutions going that starts above 1? Is it finite or infinite? So if x naught is between 0 and 1, t max is infinite, right? For the same, excuse me, for what reason? Well, you can pretty much compute it explicitly, but even if you didn't, weren't able to compute it explicitly, you know that if you start somewhere between 0 and 1, you cannot go above that, this equilibrium, right? So you're always going to be bound to be below. You're never going to be able to explode, so you can always go a little bit more, a little bit further up. Right? See, that's a proof that this is infinite. I mean, we didn't write anything down, but um, right. The fact that there is a cap, there is a, like a, a a ceiling here. That's a constant solution, and the fact that any solution and no two solutions can match and intersect gives you this statement. Again, what if you start above one? Hmm. How do you know? Same reason, never stop. Well, um, I don't. I don't think I'll have the time to solve this. But if you solve this, you'll actually see that it goes has vertical asymptote. Of course, if you start uh, higher, then it's gonna. You know, it's it's a. It's autonomous, so this translates, right? Every single solution will have a vertical asymptote. You have no way of knowing by looking at the direction field, right? You have to do more. You have to either solve it explicitly, which you can in this case, right? It's a, well, not a nasty, but it's a partial fraction decomposition. You have to do it, okay? You have to do it to, I mean, don't just take my word. Uh, but you will see that actually the solution is, I mean, it just phew, takes off and then just, it's, it's faster than an exponential. I mean, it, it stops at a time that is depending on the initial condition, but it stops. So this is finite. Of course, it depends on x naught. The, the closer x naught is to 1, the longer lifespan is there, right? Of course, on the other side, it's infinite. Okay? Very different than linear systems. So if this happens in one dimension, imagine what happens in two dimensions and four dimensions and all that. Okay? All right, so that's 
there is one one other thing here in this chapter which talks about variational equation, and I I, I promise I'll come back to this uh, because it's it's important. But I want to I want to get to equilibria. Mm -hmm. um, so so variational uh, equation. Uh, we'll come back later. Not to to. Uh, Too much. I mean, not, not too late. But um, I'd like to talk, talk about equilibria of nonlinear systems. Again, um, and I just want to point. There is this exploration section in end of chapter seven, which talks about. Um, Other ways of, of approximating solutions um, of a differential equation, okay, and actually are the ways that are more practical. I mean, first of all, is the Euler method, Euler's, me Euler's method. Um, it's different than this Picard iteration, right? Um, but it's also very inefficient. So there is improved Euler method. There is Runge-Kata. Method. These are numerical methods for solving differential equations, okay? And they are different in nature than the uh, Runge Kata. But in some cases, excuse me, different in nature than the Picard iteration. But in some cases, the idea of the Picard iteration is actually can be used in, like when you talk about partial differential equations and other things. Um, so, the ideas are important. I mean, I mean, the practicality of the ideas may not be always obvious, okay? But the ideas are important, um, are, are critical, actually. Um, okay, so we've seen a little bit of this of this uh, systems uh, of this non of this equilibria, haven't we? Um, the nonlinear pendulum was that example I, I kept giving you. Um, let me let me pick an, on on a different one, for instance. Um, so, what is an equilibrium? Just it's a real. It's the same thing as in one D. Don't don't tell me the equilibria are complex. Okay, an equilibrium is a state of a system. It's it's a point in the phase space where if you start there, you stay there. Okay. So, an equilibrium is, let's, let me put it X star, is a point such that, well, such that X of t is identical x star for all t is a solution right of the differential equation of the of the well, of the dynamo of the system right now how can a constant be a solution well x prime of that is zero so f of x star has to be zero so, f of x star has to equal zero. Okay, it's it's as simple as that. So, when you are um, seeking equilibria, so for example, let's say x prime is. Uh, x minus y squared and y prime is y minus x. It's a nonlinear system. Bad, bad news. I 
I mean, uh, there's work to do. I mean, there's there's a ton of work if you want to understand dynamics of of initial condition, right? Of, of, of a system that has initial conditions, you know, given and. But at least one thing, it's easy. Well, it's it's easy in principle. Is equilibria are points for which. The right hand side of each equation uh, this, uh, simultaneously is zero. And you end up with an algebraic system. Well, it's still nonlinear, so it's still a bad news, but it's not a differential system. It's just a system of, linear, of, of uh, equations. Well, you know, you can solve, whether you can solve it explicit or not, that's another story, but. You know, obviously, in this case, you could. So, what do, what do you get? Y equals y squared, and x equals y. So, you get y equals zero, or y equals one. And for each y, there is an x, right? So, what are the equilibrium in the x y in the phase space? These two equilibrium, right? So, I mean, again, you could end up with some some system of equations that is it's very difficult to find the the, uh, the, the even the equilibrium for, to solve that explicitly, right? But that's not that's not news. I mean, there's you know we don't we don't like to, we don't necessarily seek explicit formulas for our solutions. We like to understand behavior near equilibrium and stuff like that, right? So that's kind of the there, there's kind of the two uh, uh, major discussions. What, how can you, uh, can you capture the behavior near equilibria of, of your def non, of your nonlinear system and can you capture the behavior far from equilibrium? Well, near equilibria is is a lot um, easier than far from equilibrium. So this this would be sort of local behavior, whereas far from equilibrium would be a global behavior. You'd like to understand the picture globally, you know, away from equilibrium. Well, near equilibria, the story is. Well, somewhat uh, easy, somewhat easy to explain, and but it's not necessarily uh, true in general. So uh, let me give an example. So let me uh, have this example here. So um, x prime equals x plus y squared, and y prime equals minus y. I could have done it for that. The one above two, but okay. So it's very, it's kind of somewhat similar. What's the only? Well, in this case, there's only one equilibrium because y has to be zero, and then this has to be zero. So x has to be zero, right? So it has only one equilibrium, zero zero. Okay. But when you actually try to solve, uh, well, when you do Picard iterations or whatever numerical method you do, in our case, you go to p-plane and you point and click, right? Um, you will actually see this, and I, I won't be able to reproduce this, but we can actually do it. I'll just save the time. Go to p-plane, type this in. You can write. There's nothing that prohibits you to do nonlinear systems there. That's a nice thing. Um, and um, copy and paste the picture, right? And you will see this kind of. I mean, I know it's, it's a twisted. It's not a very standard, right? 
still there is something you can actually uh, uh, explain in this picture from from the uh, be, because near near this equilibrium. Okay? Mm -hmm. Near this equilibrium, you can actually what we call linearize uh, the, the nonlinear system. near zero zero would actually amount to the following. So instead of x prime equals f of x, we, we're going to consider, and that needs an explanation, but we're going to consider The following system, and what's what do I mean by this? This is this is the Jacobian. That's the matrix of the partial derivatives evaluated at this equilibrium point. So, in our case, well, well let me let me say this is at x star near x star, okay? In our case, x star is 0, 0. Maybe I'll put it like this. Uh, so it would be x prime equals this Jacobian at 0, 0 times x, right? And this is a matrix. That's a, that's a constant matrix. So df is partial of f1 with respect to x. I think I have x and y. So let me do let me do f and g. So then let me say f f is little f little g. So then it's going to be partial of f with respect to x, partial of f with respect to y, partial of g with respect to x, partial of g with respect to y. Okay? So what is in our case is one, right? Two y zero negative one. Okay. I just take the partial derivatives of little f and little g. But you see, I don't stop here. But I actually evaluate this at the equilibrium. At the equilibrium. So at zero zero. This would be. 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Okay. So the linearization is actually now 1, 0, 0, negative 1, x. And this we know how it looks. This is uh, actually in canonical form, right? This goes away in this direction and goes down in this direction. So when you compare these two, what can you say? Hmm? This looks straight. I mean, that's one canonical form, right? That is like a little bit deformed, but it's not too badly deformed, right? So can you call these two related? How do we call them? Uh, conjugate. Conjugate. Can we, I mean, uh, even though we may not be able to find an explicit conjugacy, can you imagine deforming this plane into that plane? At least near the, or near the equilibrium. Yeah, OK? Now, as it turns out, this, so, the um, face uh, portrait of x star, uh, excuse me, of x prime equals f of x is conjugate to the, well, I, I should say just the system is conjugate, right? The two systems are conjugate. But the two face portraits are, are conjugate to uh, the face portrait. Face portrait um, 
of delinearization. And in general, this may not be uh, this may not be explicit, but in this case, um, there's actually an explicit form. Okay, um, here's why. H of x y is x plus one third y squared and y. Okay, and you'll say, you know, how on earth did we figure this out? Well, and it's hard. It's it's mostly impossible to to figure out the conjugacy in general, unless you see some very um, sort of clear patterns. Uh, how do you? How can you verify? So if somebody gives you this and says, "Check this is a conjugacy." How do you do that? Well, you, you can simply do the following. You can simply say, well, this, is, this, is, this would be a nonlinear change of variables, right? Think of this as a nonlinear change of variables. A map from R2 to R2 basically assigns to points, points. But ones have some x and y coordinates. So if you have this u and v as the new coordinates, well, just take u prime and v prime and see what they look like in the in the new coordinates what the old system looks in the new coordinates so u prime is x prime plus two-thirds y y prime v prime is just y prime right so this guy is minus y that's the old right so this is minus v Right? When you do this combination here, x prime, and you plug in x prime and y prime, you get x plus one third y squared after you do that combination, which is u. So you see, u prime equals u, and v prime equals negative v. So the, the original system, which was Right? The original system, through this nonlinear change of variables, has transformed into a linear system. Right? Okay? So that's actually something that it can be done always, but may not be done explicitly. Okay? And also, it may only be done locally. So in other words, uh, right? when you have when you have two equilibria, in this case there was only one, but if you had two equilibria, you cannot conjugate that to something linear, because linear only has zero as equilibrium. Right? But it can be done uh, in a local local fashion. I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, can I ask you to read just one example that page 162 that talks about just a different change of variables from rectangular to polar coordinates all right and then uh, I'll post the let's see the problems that I want to keep on um, well actually everything except number nine which is in polar coordinates but if you read that you'll be able to do that as well but you know I won't necessarily ask you to do that number nine okay thank you